Hello and welcome to this Legal Week video in association with Honeycomb Forensic Accounting. With me here in the studio is its Managing Director, Jeffrey Davidson, and we're going to talk about the role of a General Counsel as a, as a proactive manager of risk and compliance. Welcome, Jeffrey. Hello. Now, you see, you've got this vision for the role of uh, General Counsel, but it goes a long way beyond the sort of box ticking of compliance. Um, tell us about that. Well, my, uh, my vision for General Counsel is to see them as the arbiter of the culture of the business. Um, they are the people who are best able to, um, to create a balance between the different tensions in the business. Um, on the one hand, you have the salesmen. You have the people who are out there uh, creating uh, new services, um, new products, and they just want to sell. Um, at the other end, you have those who are... Uh, tasked with compliance. They have checklists, they have uh, uh, tick lists, and they're just there to make sure that um, the rules are kept to. Um, there's a tension between these two, um, and the salesmen need to know that they have to sell with safety. Um, and general counsel is the person who can sit above both of these two sides of the business and say to the salesman, look, we know we have to be entrepreneurial, we know we have to stay at the forefront of the market, but this is how you have to do it. The culture of the business is to do this safely, honestly, and with a view to the long-term welfare of the business. And they can say to those who are at the back, you can't just check the checklist. You've got to be a bit more uh, savvy, a bit more thoughtful about it. And you've got to have an understanding of what the salesmen are trying to sell so that you can be effective in managing the risk that they are creating. So you're a bit like a neutral referee. So you, you don't want to be seen as part of the, directly part of the compliance or directly part of sales, but sitting above that. Yes, I think it's more than just being a referee. I think they're able to enable both sides of this tension to do their job better. Um, they're able to understand the services and make people sell them better with a view to having services they can sell a year later. So they're not just there when something wrong happens. We all know of lawyers as being... You know, they're writing contracts, um, they're dealing with litigation, they're dealing with problems. They need to be there to stop these problems happening in the first place. And the way they do that is by saying, this is the culture of the business that can make all these parts of the business work properly. And they're people who also have the eye and the ear of the board of management, the board of directors, who can listen to them and say, yes, you now understand how to make our business run as smoothly, effectively, and safely as possible without stopping it being entrepreneurial. And of course, there's a myriad of issues that the general counsel have to look at or potential problems that they have to anticipate. And yeah. it's always very difficult for them. There's a real challenge. And you've come across a really interesting development um, that kind of gives an example of the kind of things that the really proactive general yeah. counsel is That's actually right. anticipating. Tell us about that. So one of the things that um, is key to the role of compliance, the role of risk management, is information. Um, in a narrow field, one talks about knowing one's client, but one's out there doing business with all sorts of different stakeholders, all sorts of partnerships, all sorts of agencies, and one needs to know who one is doing business with because there's the risk that you create yourself and there's risks that other people create for you. Um, and there's been a, a quite an interesting development in quite a small um, area of this in the last few weeks, um, which is about um, balancing the concept of uh, the right to be forgotten with needing to have access to information about people so that you can do business safely with them. And this has come out in a very curious way. Um, Companies House is known to people as the uh, repository for um, uh, corporate information going back many, many years. Um, and everybody in the United Kingdom who trades um, behind a corporate um, facade their information is held with Companies House. All credit reference agencies um, use the information that comes out of Companies House. Um, and there was an announcement at the beginning of August uh, where Companies House said that it was considering shortening the amount of time that it held information on businesses which had ceased to trade, businesses which were, um, uh, which were being removed from the register, from 20 years, which is the current position, to six years. Uh, six years sounds like quite a long time, but it, if you think that it takes a year or two for information to come into Companies House, um, and then 
uh, the lifetime, the short lifetime of business might be three or four years. Six years is only one generation of business activity. And people who uh, are either unlucky or unfortunate or potentially abusive of the corporate veil system, um, you need to know two or three generations, two or three iterations of their activity to be able to go back 10, 15, 20 years to work out who you're actually doing business with, how they conducted themselves, are they a risk to you? Um, and cutting from 20 to 6 years is a very significant step and interestingly runs counter to all the other efforts that Western governments are making at the moment where there's complete transparency and so this balance between the right to be forgotten and the need for businesses to know who they're dealing with um, is uh, leads to risk and yeah. this is something that corporate council need to know because they either need to be getting involved in it or if they think it's going to happen they need to devise other ways to manage the same risk of knowing who they do business with. How much information is there about this at the moment in the, in the, public, in the public sphere? Do, do we have a timetable? Have they give, explained why they're doing it? I gather it's all a it's not particularly clear at the moment. No, it, it's all very unclear at the moment. If you go to the website of Companies House, you will find nothing there. Um, if you speak to them on the phone, they will say that uh, it's still something they are considering. It came out um, because they were getting inquiries from people who wanted to have their information removed. Right. Um, so it became an issue for them and this became public and it got picked up by the press and, and one or two of the political parties are, are considering how best to deal with it. Um, but there's been no announcement. Um, it is not yet something that is happening. It is something that, uh, that might happen. Um, it, it's part of a wider debate of balancing different rights. There is now a right to be forgotten, but there is also a public right and, and a need to have public information. So at the moment, no timetable, um, no uh, decision has yet been made. Um, it, it's all out there waiting for people to consult on and make a contribution to. So right now, what should GCs be doing? Um, well, GCs can be doing one or two different things, two or three different things in this. Um, they could be noting it internally to see what do we do, what would we do if this information was no longer available. And most GCs who are active in international businesses will know how difficult it is to obtain information outside places like the UK in terms of corporate activity where there is not the same transparency in terms of corporate entities. And there are countries you can go to where you can find out absolutely nothing. So they know what the risk is if the UK were to start to go down that route. I don't want to make it um, uh, uh, over spectacular because we're only talking about dissolved companies, not talking about current yeah. companies. Yeah. Their information will still be there. But we're talking about information where it's very easy for a company to be dissolved. It's actually frighteningly easy for a company to come to life. It takes about three minutes and there's no due diligence by any government body into this. Um, so we're talking about information on businesses that people have put to rest. But those are probably exactly the ones you want to know what went on and why they were put to rest, who they owed money to and that sort of thing. So no timetable. Um, General counsel need to think, what is the risk quotient of this information not being available? What do we do about it? How do we replace it in other ways? If they want to be particularly proactive, they can think of what lobbying they can do and who they should speak to say, look, we are in the business, we're, we're in financial services, for example, we're dealing with the public. We want, the market wants, the regulator wants, the, the, the public to be protected from the risks of doing business with people we don't know who they are. So it's therefore in the public's interest that the information remains and the public interest here, for example, council might say, should take precedence over the individual's right to be forgotten. Yeah. And those are different things that council can do. Fascinating. So at uh, Corporate Council Forum, you're going to discuss this issue in a broader context of the role of yeah. GCs. What yeah. kind of... Um, you're going to be chairing a session. What kind of issues will you want to be drawing out from the audience and from the panellists? So my, my key message is going to be exactly this. You, General Counsel, um, are the people on whom the business should be relying for managing risk. Not just risk in an ad hoc capacity, but risk in a cultural sense. Um, so we're going to be talking in this session about different ways in which counsel can 
sell themselves effectively to the different stakeholders within the business, um, to the people who sell products, to the people who are devising new products, to the board of directors who stand above the business making sure that there is a, a, a long-term future, in dealing with shareholder groups, in dealing with backroom boards, in dealing with the accounts department, um, that they can sell themselves to all these groups say, look, we, we can manage a process whereby we don't stop ourselves selling because that would be pointless, nor do we create our, our business one where the backroom boys um, are preeminent. We've got a balance. So we need to talk about training. We need to talk about um, uh, creating protocols within the business. We need to train those who are in the back to understand that it's good to sell. It's good to have a new product. It's good to be at the front of the marketplace. And we need to train those who are at the front of the marketplace that it's quite good to understand that there might be a risk of uh, selling something to um, un less desirable clients. And, and corporate counsel can be there. Uh, training, um, due diligence, re uh, the, reiterative, the reiterative process of constantly monitoring and managing how you're doing business, what the culture is of that business from top to bottom, so that you are regarded at the end of the day as innovative but also as honest and reputable. And people will then come to do business with you when they know that's how you are. And how good are they currently? You're going to have a, a, a group of GCs in the room. Are they all going to be insulted at the idea that they won't be doing this? Where do you think, where do you think they are at the moment? I'd like to think that this is a message that they want to hear. They want to be told, I'd like to think, that they are the most important people in the business. Who wouldn't? Mm. Um, corporate counsel obviously come from uh, myriad different types of people as, as anywhere else. Um, of course, they all generally come out of legal services. Their training is not in um, promoting themselves to run businesses. Their training is either in problem solving, um, in advising, um, in dealing with, uh, um, with chaos or with uh, acute problems. What I'm saying to them is you, you need to step back from all of that and you need to take a view that you have a unique role in helping a business flourish. Maybe not exactly what you were trained for, but presumably that's why you came out of that uh, sort of legal practices area to go into business, to see something mature more in a different way from just being transactional. And I'd like to think that this is something that they can grasp, that they can grow with, and that they can see themselves as more important um, talking to more people in the business, not just sitting in their um, legal department, talking to all different stakeholders in the business, and with the business growing, everyone getting a bit more out of it. And we should get some anecdotes from, from people at the session, on, on uh, you know, draw yeah. on their sort of experiences. Yes, I'd like to think so. I'm sure there will be those who tried this and had problems selling it within the business. Different businesses have different cultures. Um, they will always have found people, some who uh, they find easier to convince of this message. Some are more resistant uh, at some uh, extremes of financial services where people are having to sell quite hard. Um, they may not want this control. They may not want this, uh, um, this culture behind them. They may not want what they feel is a bit of a ball and chain right. um, holding them back. But they need to realize that this isn't holding you back. This stops you uh, having crises, acute problems, and you work in partnership. So I'd like to think that we will uh, be able to hear from some general counsel who have had really positive experiences of coming into businesses, perhaps um, on the wings of an acute problem, which is why they've come in, to being able to take their businesses into quiet waters, possibly still quite fast running waters, which is what you want, but everything managed properly and hopefully we'll have a good debate going on all those topics. Thank you very much, Geoffrey. Thank you. And thank you for watching this Legal Week video.